Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Freedom, and today I have the very distinct honor of speaking with Lisa Bowerman. Um, you know, heck, what doesn't she do? Actress, <laughs> director, photographer. Um, okay, let's start with what's going on right now. We just had an amazing bunch of announcements from Big Finish, you know, with the new series Monsters coming over, River Song coming over. Um, is there anything you'd like to say about that? Um, no, I just think it's fantastic for Big Finish. Uh, I, I, there were rumblings a few months ago. Um, I'm not actually involved in the new series um, um, productions. So I, I kept on hearing things, and then I saw an email over somebody's shoulder saying River Song. I thought, oh, no, they've got River Song. So uh, I think it's absolutely brilliant for Big Finish and more power to their elbow. Great news. Okay. Um, well, I don't know. What do you think? Would it be interesting, though, to have an adventure where they have, you know, Bernie Summerfield and you know River Song together. <laughs> I think it's uh, you're not the first person to have suggested that. <laughs> <laughs> I think it would be actually I think it would be quite fun. It it it'll, it would certainly sort out the differences between the two characters. I know there's been a, a bit of discussion over the years about how much they cross over in terms of what they do and the fact like they keep a diary and all that sort of stuff. But I think ultimately they're they're really pretty different characters. So uh, I think no, I think it'd be great fun. I gotta say, I can picture them two out on a dig together. You know? <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness me, trolls at dawn. <laughs> okay, uh, first off, um, Triumph of Sutek just came out. Yes. Um, you know, amazing, amazing piece. I listened to it just last week. Um, huh. So, what was it like bringing this old ancient god from way back in the Fourth Doctor era, you know, into Bernice's, you know, storyline? I think it's great. I think mean, I have to take my hat off to, to James Goss, um, who's the uh, producer of the, the the most recent box sets of, of Benny. Uh, you've got to try and keep reinventing a character that's been going for really quite a long time, even before I started playing it, and that's actually 17 years this year, which is quite unbelievable, really. And um, I think, uh, actually, he, he says in the extras, you know, they were thinking about something that could really... Um, crossover with uh, an arch enemy and in terms of Doctor Who arch enemies from the past which you know we're allowed to use uh, he suddenly thought of Sutek and of course he also thought that Sutek would be a great match uh, with the Bernice series because uh, obviously she's an archaeologist so the two um, fitted together very very well um, I, I thought it was absolutely brilliant and the fact that Gabriel Wolf is, is still um, up and running and doing the voice uh, that was even more exciting uh, so I, I was I was thrilled, absolutely thrilled. Oh yeah, G Gabriel Wolf definitely has not lost that character. <laughs> oh, no, <laughs> <laughs> he did spectacular in that. Oh, and you did too. I love the whole cast. Um, what was it like working, you know, with Sylvester and uh, Sophie again after a while? Uh, it's great. Well, obviously we've done quite a few uh, crossovers over the years, and um, obviously you know I'd, I'd worked with them on uh, Survival back in 1989, um, and they are the nicest people in the world to work with. I mean, even even back in the day when when we did Survival, I think the success of of most shows uh, are to do with you know who's at the top, who are the regulars, and they were so wel welcoming and so lovely, and um, obviously. Obviously, I started up with Bernice again uh, in 1998. Uh, uh, sorry, yes, 1998, that's right. <laughs> Get my sums right. And um, then they did a crossover. The first Big Finish crossover with Doctor and, and Ace was in 2000, I think, with Shadow of the Scourge. And ever since then, we've sort of you know, crossed it. There have been a couple of crossovers. Um, and then, of course, we started not too long ago adapting the new adventure novels. So they were very much back on board within the kind of universe that Bernice exists in. Um, and again, Sophie is actually a very old friend of mine. You know, we've we've known each other since survival. We see each other on conventions and, and socially as well. So uh, that's always a joy. And, and Sylvester is terrific fun to have in the studio. He's, he's, he's a lovely, lovely guy. And uh, we just, you know hit the ground running really and I think the fact that we do know each other probably helps a little bit in the um, in the dynamic of the cast anyway so that that works very well okay yeah Bern yeah Bernice Summerfield as you said has been around quite a while um, what do you think gives her her staying power why do you think people keep coming back to her as a character well I, I think Paul Cornell created a, a really great character I mean if you look in terms of um, her 
if you can if you compare her to a lot of the other Doctor Who companions, I think she really was very much of her time. Obviously, in the New Adventures, she was probably uh, a little bit more um, controversial, should we say, than she would have been allowed to be on television. So that gave her a bit of latitude. But I think she's she's ultimately she's not superhuman. She's a she's fallible, but she has a very strong sense of what is right and what is wrong she has a great sense of humor um she doesn't always get it right <laughs> and um she's i think she's rather good company uh, and i i think w- what i've been lucky with is is that most writers i think it, actually it happens when strong characters are created most writers know how to write for them um i've been lucky enough to be involved in the jago and mikefoot series and when you look at the for example at the strength of characters of both Jago and Lightfoot that, that Robert Holmes uh, created, uh, they have an enduring um, an enduring nature because they're so strong and every writer knows how to write for them. Uh, and I think the same pretty much goes for, for Bernice as well. Um, so generally, I, th- I think she's quite good company, really. I think that's why. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, now how did the Bernice Summer of the Field thing come about? How were you first contacted for that? Um, well, I knew uh, Mike Tucker, who was the uh, visual effects designer, one of the visual effects guys on Survival. And a lot of us kept in contact after that show. Um, we all made friends. And uh, he had been writing for the New Adventures series. And I, I think he invited me to dinner one evening. He said, listen, I've had a conversation with a guy called Gary Russell. Um, and as it turned out, Gary had interviewed me for a fan um video called I was a Doctor Who monster and I remember thinking you know getting on with him at the time but apparently to cut an extremely long story short um, he'd heard that a company called Big Finish was starting up and they obviously at that stage didn't have the Doctor Who license but were looking for Doctor Who related things they might be able to produce with with actors who'd been in the show before and um, they got this character called Bernie Summerfield from the Virgin New Adventures and Gary Russell had wondered whether I might be interested in playing her. Now, I didn't have a clue what any of that meant when somebody said, I said, who, who is, who, what's her name? I'm, how, what? Anyway, um, Mike showed me a couple of the books. Then it went very, very quiet. Um, basically, I, I'd met Gary. Uh, a friend of his had remembered me. Um, and they knew that also that I'd done quite a lot of radio drama for the BBC over the years. So I suppose there was a, a, an advantage in that I had experience in, in the audio world. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, so I didn't quite know what the setup was uh i that it, it, everything then went very very quiet um by all accounts there'd been a, a problem trying to sort out the license with uh, virgin publishing and so what happened was that i was then asked to audition for it so uh, uh, and i thought initially oh I've, I've got this role i don't know what it is um in the meantime i'd been to see my friend stephen fuel who happened to be in a tour of romeo and juliet that was going around the country and he'd heard rumors uh, that that this was happening and he said are you playing benny summerfield and i said oh that ah i couldn't remember what her name was i said i have no idea i might be and then she it, then quite i mean it's been recorded a number of times he said, oh, she's an icon, you've got to play her. And it turns out he'd read all the books and was a huge fan of the New Adventures. Anyway, cut to the chase. Um, I then got a call saying, would I go and audition uh, at Nick Briggs' uh, flat? So I trotted along there and I walked in and there was a microphone strapped to an uplighter and Jason Haig, Ellery, Gary Russell and Nick Briggs sitting on a sofa and thinking, oh, Lordy, what's this about? You know, um, three, three fanboys in the front room with a microphone strapped to an uplighter. What's going on? So I, uh, I read uh, actually the script for Oh No, It Isn't, which is the most peculiar thing. You've, I mean, again, for the American audiences, uh, it probably um, is a bit peculiar, Oh No, It Isn't, which is the very first Bernice adaptation that, that came out because it's all based on the land of Panto. I think in this country the references are, are, are probably a little bit more obvious. But anyway, I read this. Um, I thought, oh, this is jolly. Um, I thought she was a good character. And then the next thing I knew, uh, I, I got the job. So uh, I really thought it was going to last two weeks. I thought it was just, you know, a little vanity project um, that was, as it turned out, it was recorded in a, a, a really damp basement in a slightly dodgy part of London called Elephant and Castle. And... Uh, I, uh, and the next thing I know, I'm being launched at conventions and being interviewed for sci-fi magazines, and I hadn't even told my agent, so I was a bit kind of, whoa, what's going on? And um, 
17 years later, I'm still here. So that's that. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it, it, you know. It's weird. You know, you walk into these things, ah, it's just going to be a bit part, you know, and then <laughs> <laughs> wham, here you are still going. Absolutely. Um, speaking of that, um, one of the another first that happened with the Triumph of Sutek was you had to go and record a video trailer for it. Um, yeah. What was it like? you know performing as Benny in front of a camera rather than a microphone yeah that was a bit weird um I I think it was maybe Scott Hancock's idea who's who's now you know who directs the Benny series and uh, we've got the lovely chap Tom Saunders who does a lot of the video um trailers for uh, Big Finish now and I think they suddenly decided that a live action trailer would be a good idea I I I, I didn't even cross my mind I thought oh right okay um i think they didn't think i was going to learn the lines but i knew i had to <laughs> so i i learned the script that that scott had uh, given me and actually we recorded it in the next door studio to moat studio which is um quite well known as the, the the main studio that big finish used to record all their stuff and toby who runs it's got an extra little studio next door to the main one where we record um the books and uh or the dramas rather and um I went in there and it was literally just a, a, a screen at the back. Everything else was CGI. So, uh, dear old Tom, um, I had to kind of hold on to the camera as if I was holding on to the camera myself. And uh, we had to duck when I had to duck and look around when I had to look around. Um, I, it is very difficult because you don't know wh whether your interpretation, because you're so used to just reading these things, is going to be completely different from what you've been playing for 17 years. But I suppose... I've been doing it so long now. I, I hope that what I did was near enough to what people <laughs> expected. Uh, but it was weird. Yeah, it was really weird. And I didn't know how it was going to turn out. It was, in fact, only when it came out a couple of weeks ago. It's the first time I'd seen it. So uh, it was uh, that was very exciting. Uh, I think it's probably the only time it's going to happen. But uh, it, it was rather, rather marvellous. <laughs> yeah, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I thought it was a nice twist. Yeah. And also, it's been so great that the, the, the response of it's been very, very positive. So uh, I think it sort of ach achieved its aim, which is brilliant. Okay, let's talk about Ellie Hickson. Um, uh. that, I, I, I had been listening to Jago and Lightfoot for like, you know, eight going on nine series. And I was like, you're kidding me. That's Lisa Bowerman? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> well, I'm glad you said that. Because a lot of people think, oh, it's her again. Um, <laughs> I, um, that, I, that was by default, to be honest. I, when we did the very first Companion Chronicle, uh, which was the Mahogany Murderers, uh, which David uh, Richardson produced, uh, they decide, I, I don't know whether they decided or Andy Lane, as, as a sort of theatrical device, had thrown in the barmaid as a sort of um, go-between in the conversation that Jago and Lightfoot have over the bar about, you know, what had happened in terms of the story. <clears throat> and because I, as ever, I'm around and I'm cheap, I said, oh, all right, I'll just, I'll fill that in then. And I thought, oh, God, I've got to pick a voice that isn't like Benny. So I just kind of, kind of put it up here, you know. <laughs> I thought, oh, all right, I'll, I'll do this. And I, that won't ever be heard again. That'll be fine. And the next thing I know, when, when obviously we commissioned it because Christopher and Trevor are so fantastic and the writing was so great and the characters are just, oh, they're my favourite. They're brilliant. Um, uh, David said, oh, we're, we're, we're carrying on with Ellie Higson. So I, I spent most of my time apologising for it, but I'm so glad you didn't think it was me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God for that. <laughs> yeah, you had me full because I had just never bothered to look, you know, because ah, I... Ah, good. And you, you know, excellent performance. Well, well, was she always intended to play such a larger role? Because I noticed as the series went on, she's getting more and more and more stuff. Um, well, actually, actually, it does vary from from series to, season to season. She hasn't got so much in season nine. I mean, obviously, I I'm a bit protective of my um, you know involvement with uh, Jago and Lightfoot because obviously I've directed bar one of the series uh, box series um, I've directed all of them so there's only a certain amount of acting and directing I can do in, in, in at the same time and it's a bit like juggling teapots really um, not that I, I, I mind but it's uh, um, it's nice when suddenly Ellie has a nice little bit I loved her bit in series 5 I don't know whether it's a spoiler turn off now if it is a spoiler for series 5 uh, that was set in, in the 60s and there are reasons why she is still around which um which people will discover when they listen to it. But uh, I loved how she was written in that. Um, I don't know whether she was ever planned to be 
that involved but actually I think as ever the writers have created this character that works very well in the dynamic between uh, Jago and Lightfoot I, I mean Chris and Trevor are always joking about the fact I'm and he's going off for their own series you know <laughs> they're going to be taking over one day and I'll be included in the title and all that sort of stuff but uh, I think in terms of the Red Tavern being the meeting point I think you know she's very useful in, in those terms okay now one question I forgot to ask um had you ever even heard of Doctor Who when they first contacted you about all this stuff? Or oh, god, yes, absolutely. I mean, I'm a I'm a child of the '60s. You know, I mean, I was brought up with this stuff. Um, I, w people ask me occasionally whether I was a fan, and I wouldn't say I'm a fan in in the conventional sense. I certainly watched the show. I always used to watch the show. Um, a, a little little known factoid is that my brother, uh, who, one of my other brothers, who's also an actor, happened to be in the Talons of Wang Chiang. Um, he was working at the theatre they were filming it at and uh, he played one of the stage managers funnily enough <laughs> I didn't say anything but you know it's it's amazing so I remember him getting me Tom Baker's autograph that was very exciting um, but no I, I mean I remember I do have even vague recollections of William Hartnell so uh, I knew I, I didn't have an extensive knowledge of it the way that, that a lot of the guys who work for Big Finish do but I certainly know um, I, oh, I knew of Doctor Who obviously and, and then uh, I mean, slightly sadly, when when I did it, obviously it was the last one that went out of the classic series back in 1989. Um, the affection for Doctor Who was something that you kept very quiet. Every, you know, uh, the age of the geek hadn't quite sort of surfaced at that point, and the BBC didn't show a lot of love to it at, back in the day. So I think we were put out in a midweek against a very popular soap opera called Coronation Street. So the viewers were pretty much done by the time I got involved. Um, but it still had that frisson of being involved in something that, that was classic, you know. Okay, do you watch any of the uh, new series that's out? Oh, oh yes, I do. Indeed, I, I didn't uh, catch all of the, the new one with Peter Capaldi, but um, I'm, I'm a big fan of Peter Capaldi's. I think he, he's terrific. And I was a, actually, I've been a huge fan of most of the actors who've played it since they, they brought it back. They, they've done some really, really good casting. I mean, obviously, um, Chris Eccleston, great actor. David, great actor. I mean, Matt Smith, what a great piece of casting. I thought he was fantastic. Um, and, and completely out of left field uh, I thought, you know, Stephen Moffat was very clever to, to cast Matt, I thought he was terrific and now to have gone from Matt to somebody like Peter Capaldi is, is great great, very exciting Oh yeah, no, I've, I've been enjoying his performance oh, incredibly, he's just you know, very, very, you know, very good Oh, you know? <laughs> yeah, I mean he's a class, he's a class act, but the fact that he understands Doctor Who as well so much is, I think is a kind of cher cherry on the cake really, isn't it? Now let's say you you know just out of nowhere you get a phone call saying you know we'd like you to be on the new Doctor Who series um would you take it or what do you think <laughs> <laughs> did i have to ask <laughs> Actually, I am going to let you into a little bit, again, a slightly lesser known fact. A couple of years ago, I actually was called up uh, to be in the episode Utopia. And I thought, oh, great, Doctor Who, marvellous. Oh, I can get on that. And then I found out it was a non-speaking role. And I thought, oh, 20 years ago, I had a speaking role. So I went up for it. It was, it was this sort of mad cat lady, another mad cat lady, funny that, um, who was, uh, was kind of snarling around all over the place. And... Um, I did actually turn up for the interview because I thought it would be a, a good thing to do anyway to, to meet the guys and it turned out to, uh, that Graham Harper was directing who I know from the convention circuit and he's a lovely, lovely man, really nice man and um, I wasn't too sure what was going to happen but anyway they offered it to me and I, I, was, I was slightly bold and I actually said no because I think I like to say some lines really <laughs> that's, that's my thing really and I, I think I've done cats now so um, uh, that 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 would have been you know um, something, but oh, of course, yes, of course. I think I think, mind you, if you ask any every, every me member of Equity in this country whether they'd like to do Doctor Who, most of the answer would be yes, <laughs> which is why they get such fantastic casts. You know. Okay, um, heading away from all that, I also heard that you're a professional photographer. I am. Yeah. Um, have you published anything <laughs> of it or? Uh, oh. well, no, it's it, it's funny that I mean I um. I started up taking photographs. It's it's mainly actors' headshots that I do and um, production photographs. You know, if you go to a theatre and you see show photos outside, it's that, that sort of thing. Um, 
And I started at drama school uh, many years ago. I thought, well, you know, I, I saw a lot of people ripped off for really bad photographs. And I thought, oh, I, I could do that. And I um, mean, yeah, I did art A level, and I, I know, you know, what a, uh, which is a, you know, a higher kind of exam that you, you do when you're in the, in the sixth form here. And um, I think I know what a picture should look like compositionally. But also, you've got to understand that the vast majority of actors hate having their photographs taken. And uh, I, I thought there was a sort of inverse psychology, psychological way of taking photographs without intim intimidating people too much. So, cut a long story short, um, I, I took a lot of photographs while I was at, at college, but um, when I left drama school, luckily I, I didn't need a second string, so I sort of kept it up as a hobby. And then um, when inevitably most act actresses' careers hit the buffers, which is after a few years, um, I, I started it up as a business. Uh, I then became quite popular as a, as a spotlight that's the big actors directory that everybody puts their, their pictures in uh, I, I became quite successful on that front to the point where everybody thought I'd given up acting so it became a bit of a problem so um, I, I often think perhaps I should have pursued um, photography and maybe a bit more street photography or, or kind of um, uh, you know what I mean, uh, um, fly on the wall photography, which I, I really quite like. But I think, like most things, if you have what is known as a portfolio career and you do lots of things, you don't really concentrate enough on the one thing that you need to concentrate on. So it's always been a, a source of income for me, but I've never had an exhibition. I've had things published, yeah, absolutely. I've, I've taken the odd picture of, uh, of things for... Um, do you remember Dreamwatch magazine? That goes back a bit. Um, I took some photos uh, of Christopher Lee uh, for that and um, uh, Jerry Anderson, who created Thunderbirds. Uh, that was very exciting. Uh, but generally, it's it's been actors who ring me up and they come to me and I, I take their photograph. Uh, and uh, it's very nice to be asked. Uh, it became a bit of a nine to five job, but I'm, I'm still doing it from time to time. Um, I have to say the directing is, has taken over slightly from that, but uh, it's it's something that I enjoy. Um, I do get, every, every time I get invited to a party, I do get the kind of caveat, you will bring your camera, won't you? Which is <laughs> never knowingly invited to a party where you're not bringing your camera, you know? <laughs> but uh, that that I don't mind that I don't mind that it's, it's fun I I do enjoy it. The only thing that I find quite hard work is taking wedding photographs. But uh, apart from that, all right. Speaking of yeah, you've directed um, some big finish now. Um, yeah. uh, are there is there any you know experiences from that you'd like to share with us briefly? Yeah, well, I've, I've been very lucky. I've had quite a good cross-section of things uh, at Big Finish. Um, very sweetly, David Richardson asked me to direct when he first, start, uh, when he first started at the company. Um, it turned out his, um, one of his favourite audios was one of the Sapphire and Steel audios that, um, that I'd directed. Um, I actually do have to thank Nigel Fares for introducing me to directing at Big Finish because he got me on board for uh, when he used to do The Tomorrow People. And uh, and then Sapphire and Steel, of course, which uh, was fantastic. I mean, you couldn't have got a better cast if you asked. Um, sadly, uh, Big Finish don't have the, the license for that anymore, so uh, um, they're, they're unavailable. So people will have to troll the internet for those now, but they really are terrific. I was really, really proud of those. Um, then, of course, uh, I started with uh, The Companion Chronicles, uh, which I love because there's an intimacy to those sort of dramas, those almost two-handed dramas uh, that you can't get on the on the big um, big cast ones. And I've been exceptionally lucky and had some brilliant scripts on those. And that also goes, I have to say, for um, the Blake Seven series, which I did last year. Um, I did uh, the second series of the full cast Blake Seven last year. I don't know whether your listeners know Blake Seven um, because it, it was a little bit of a, a sort of domestic cult hit over uh, here in the late 70s, um, 70s, early 80s. And um, uh, we also do the sort of uh, companion chronicle version of those called the Liberator Chronicles. And those have also been fantastic to do. Uh, and uh, I think Big Finish as, as a company have stumbled on some of the best writers out there. We've had some terrific scripts. We really have. So uh, on that sense, I feel like I've been very lucky indeed. Um, I've uh, also worked on, again, another thing, sadly, Big Finish didn't have, uh, which was Stargate. Um, I think we were a little bit disappointed that Stargate didn't do quite as well as it should have done, but I think, um, I suppose, the vast majority of fans are, are out in America. And traditionally, I suppose, audio drama isn't something that they're 
they're brought up with, I suppose. So uh, I think a lot of uh, Stargate fans thought that it was a substitute for making a new series, when of course it wasn't. It was just a, an addition to have some lovely original characters from Stargate and uh, doing some great dramas. But they were great fun to do, again. Okay. Well, fun I... is the watchword. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I know you've got to get running along. and That's uh... okay. I, I'm just about out of questions, to be honest with you. <laughs> oh, no. I've like covered lots. That can't be. <laughs> uh, no. oh, okay. Um, well, I'm sorry. well, I can give one other mention. Um, it says here you were a trustee of the Actors Charitable Trust. Uh, how's your work going with that still? Oh, uh, that, I, I, I actually used to be a trustee of the Actors Charitable, Pro Charitable Trust. Yeah, I used to be involved with a, a place called um, Denville Hall, which is the Actors Retirement Home. Um, I was actually uh, Lala Ward who was the lady who got me involved in that, is now chairman again. But I was her, her predecessor as, as chairman of the uh, House Committee there. So that, you know, included uh, being a trustee of the Actors Charitable Trust, which is now actually called the Actors Children's Trust. It's all, uh, everything's slightly changed organisation-wise. But it's it's a brilliant uh, organisation. Um, Denville looks after... Um, elderly actors and I, I know there's a, a very similar sort of screen guild one uh, over in the states um it's great to know it exists let's put it that way and we're very very lucky we've got some great supporters on that and the actors charitable trust also looks after uh, children of actors who you know might have fallen on hard times or had problems at home so um both of them are very very worthy charities and i, I was very lucky to be involved with them they, they, they do great work okay um Looking to the future, is there anything you know you're working on now? We should be looking out for coming out soon. Um, or? Well, we're, we're still doing a lot more of the adapt the Virgin New Adventures adaptations, which is exciting. Um, th th there are things that I can't mention, unfortunately, that are very exciting. Um, but it, as ever with Big Finish, they always have something up their sleeve at some point or another. So um, all I can say is watch this space. Okay, um, I just want to thank you very, very much, Lisa, for your time. Uh, That's okay. Thanks for asking. I, I very, very much enjoyed interviewing you. Um, I, I would like to ask if you'd like to come back sometime in the future, maybe do a small Q&A panel. Oh, I'd be delighted to, yeah. Okay, then we'll have to set that up. But um, once again, thank you, thank you, thank you. I cannot thank you enough. It's been great interviewing you. <laughs> Thanks um, very much, Steve. Um, and for the rest of the audience out there, take care. Enjoy the rest of your day, and have a good one.